thank you for all for joining. And our, today's topic is how to write a great blog. And Adrian um, was talking about it as an ERP blog. I'm actually going to talk about it as a blog overall, but we'll we'll call out some specifics on the ERP side as we go through it. And um, nothing nothing special about the frog blog um, picture that's up there, other than the fact that it's really hard to show a picture of a blog. But I thought this was a really cute title. And I think the Rainforest Alliance does a nice job of actually tying the title of their blog into the content that they put out there. So as we get into today, um, let me start off by just giving you a little bit of background. If you don't know who I am or you haven't heard, heard me talk before, uh, I've been around sales and marketing for over 25 years. Um, I spent nine years with Great Plains Software prior to their acquisition by Microsoft. So I've actually never worked for Microsoft. Uh, I spent six years with SAP, with the SAP Business One product. I did uh, kind of the the 2000 internet boom, bouncing around a whole bunch of companies like a lot of people with Alara and Macromedia. Um, and I actually started my career in sales, um, selling for um, continental cable, selling advertising for them, and actually selling. Welcome to GoToWebinar, webinars made easy. Really grown over the last five years um, into a marketing agency that I'll say a little bit more about in a second. Um, unlike a lot of people in marketing, it's actually what I went to school for. And it's what I love doing. So I'm, I'm finally back uh, doing the stuff that I'm really passionate about. So leading results, my company, as I said, we're a marketing services agency. We do coaching. We do consulting. We do doing. So we actually do the marketing for people. Um, for some folks, that means that they've outsourced their marketing and their business development to us overall. We help them set the strategy, and then we go run it. Some folks have a, a junior team or a few people in-house, and they're looking for some help coaching them and making them more effective, and we do that as well. We've dropped in and been a, a part-time VP of marketing for people when they're in transition. And we also take all of the things that we understand, all the knowledge that we have, and we make it available in a subscription service called Bite Size Business Development. When we're doing marketing for people, we're actually using HubSpot as the engine that we drive all of our marketing through. And if you work with Adrian and ERP VAR, you're very familiar with HubSpot because it's what she runs the site on. It's a great tool and we love working with it. Uh, and the methodology that we use when we talk about marketing, when we plan things out, is based off of duct tape marketing. And uh, you know, duct tape is comes out of the work that John Jans did out in the field. John was actually a Michael Gerber EMIS consultant. And so he's all about process. And it really allows us to take marketing out of this, this creative black box world and really put process around it. So I am based in Charlotte, North Carolina. As you can tell from my lack of accent, I'm not a native of North Carolina. I'm actually originally from the Northeast. But we are based down here. But our clients really are everywhere. We have clients from Vancouver to St. John's, Newfoundland, to Sydney, Australia, to uh, Dallas, Texas. So pretty much doesn't matter where you are, we can work with you. And really our goal in working with our clients is to help them generate new business without wasting money on marketing that doesn't get results for them. That's really our goal. And when we do that, we're doing that really through this core mantra. This is what we operate from. First and foremost, don't talk about the products that you sell. Talk about your problems. Talk about the problems that you solve. And we're going to come back to this when we talk about blogging because that is the core of a good blog post, talking about the problems that you solve. And then talk about the remarkably different way that I as a customer would experience working with you when you solve those problems. And lastly, be sure you tell me what I get when I work with you, not what you do. Because there's a lot of stuff going on around me, and I may not have time to do that translation. We tend to talk to our customers and our prospects in our language as opposed to theirs. We actually want to talk to them in theirs. We want to help them understand what they get. And so if we do that well, then our marketing, our business development really works well. And so I've used this word marketing a couple of times. Let's just quickly give you a definition as I'm talking about it, as Duct Tape Marketing talks about it. With marketing, we're moving people through this process of getting to know, like, and trust you so that they will ultimately try you out, then buy, become a repeat customer, and then if they're delighted, refer you. And we take people through this process by making marketing a very logical system. All right? And that system is are these seven steps. You know, get your strategy set up before your tactics. Make sure you've got a marketing hourglass that has activities and a process that moves people all the way through that no like trust, try by repeat refer. Publish educational content. Make sure all of that is out there in a total online presence. You know, we need to do some outbound marketing as well, and that's the lead generation trio. Make sure we've got sales and marketing integrated, and lastly, get this set up with a calendar. 
And so today we're really focusing in on step number three, which is published educational content. And ultimately, when we talk about it, blogging is the center of our publishing platform. It's where we want to start. All right? And I'm going to touch on, as we go through this, the why and the how. Um, the little quote that up, is up here is, is one of my favorites, and I, I, I'd love to say I could attribute it, but I can't remember where I heard it. Um, you know, the most private place on the Internet is your blog when you first start it. Nobody's going to know it's there. Nobody's going to read it. You know what? That's okay. Because eventually, if you're doing the things that we're going to talk about today, it will not be private for very long. Right? So this is, this is really where we want to start. So let's dive into the why. Why do we want to go and write a blog? Well, first and foremost, for your website, it adds some depth to it. A lot of sites, when you look at them today, really are nothing more than an animated um, or a colorful bro brochure that's easy to update. And the interesting thing about Google is that it's always looking, Google's always looking for a way to give people the most relevant information, the most relevant answers to their questions. And ultimately, if you're writing a blog, if you're always updating the content on your site through a blog, through sharing your insights, you're adding depth, but you're also feeding right into what Google is trying to accomplish. And the Hummingbird update that Google did um, late last year was really about how do we get more relevant, authoritative content to be available to the person who's asking a question. And so by adding a blog to our website, we're, we're feeding the search engine spiders. Um, we're showing some of our personality because it's not this formal corporate brochure. It's adding depth to the site. We're getting our expertise out there. Um, and ultimately, it lets us really have a thought leadership platform. That's what we really want to do. The other bullet up here that I didn't touch on is, is the whole idea about repurposing your work. And the beautiful thing about a blog is that it gives you a place to tell a different version of the story. So for instance, maybe you went out on a sales call and a customer asked, or, or a prospective customer asked a really great question that you gave a really great answer to. You know, and you say in the back of your head, man, I'd like to be able to use that again. That was a really great answer. Well, a blog gives you a place to reuse that answer. So you can repurpose your work and repurpose your thoughts out there as well. All right? The one thing we've got to remember about our blog is that ultimately it's not about being followed. It's not about how many people read every single blog post that you write and everything that you put on your website. The purpose of that blog is to help you get found. When somebody types in a query in a search engine, when they go looking for something, the fact that you've written about it will help you get found, and that's what we're trying to get to. Right? You know, does this work? Do people actually get business from their blog? Um, this, is, this is from HubSpot's um, State of the Market uh, survey that they do every year, and this is from last year's, which was published just about a year ago. They haven't, they haven't done one for 2013 and that they published in 2014 yet. Um, but if you look at it, you can see that 82% uh, of the marketers who blog daily report a positive ROI um, for all of their inbound marketing efforts. But if you look at this, you can see the, the people who are blogging and say that they get good response for trying to attract people to their website, getting inbound, getting inbound, even in the, that you know, two to three times a week or weekly, they're still showing really good positive response. They're getting more traffic. And we'll, we'll cover on results at the end. We'll talk, um, both Adrian and I are going to talk a little bit about some of the results that we've seen from our own efforts, just to give you some real numbers to work with. And you'll see that contributing to a blog, even on a weekly basis, does create a lot of impact for your business. Why, again, why does this happen? One of the things I'd, I'd ask you to think about is the, the time value of a marketing tactic. Um, we all know about the time value of money and how money compounded and interest grows over time. Well, the same thing happens with content-based marketing, and blogging is a form of content-based marketing. When we do any periodic um, marketing technique, whether you know we're dropping a piece of direct mail or we're running an ad, um, we're doing a seminar or a webinar, what happens is quickly over time you build up some level of interest. You know, people opening the mail piece, opening the email, registering for the webinar, but then after that event is over, after that direct mail piece has been sitting on their desk for a week, after that email has been sitting in their inbox for four hours, 
the value of it drops off very quickly. But just the opposite thing happens when we talk about content-based marketing. You could write a blog post and it doesn't get a lot of traffic for the first six months that it's sitting out there. But then suddenly a couple of people find it, a few other people link to it, somebody tweets about it, and it becomes more valuable over a period of time. We have blog posts that we wrote four years ago that still consistently generate 30 to 50 visitors per month to our site. They're incredibly valuable because month after month, month, you know, people are coming in, reading that post, and then learning about other things that are going on on our website, right? So as, as you think about, you know, is it worth the effort? Is it worth the work? Writing is hard, right? You know, getting this stuff done all the time is really difficult to do. But it becomes more valuable, not less valuable over time. If you put that post up and nobody reads it, so what? They might be reading it a month from now. And that's what you've got to keep in mind. All right, so there, there's a number of the whys I want to do that. Let's talk a little bit about the how you do it. How do you do it most effectively? And how do you go out and write a great blog post? All right, so first and foremost, a really great post is structured to solve a problem. Well, what problem? You know, the, the prospects who are out there looking for a new ERP system, their problem isn't generally how do I go buy Sage? How do I go buy SAP? How do I go buy Microsoft? They, they have a, you want to write to the problems that they had or have that are getting them to start looking for a new solution independent of brand to start with. So you need to be thinking about what are the, the customer's needs and the problems that they have in their business. Is it their, the, the challenges they've got with inventory turnover or inventory tracking or getting product shipped on time, um, getting invoices out on time, dealing with dunning letters. I mean, there's, there's millions of problems that our prospects have in their business every single day. And within that realm of problems that they have, there are certain things that you and your organization are expert at solving and that you have insights to. You may understand that the reason that people are having issues with their inventory turnover, with dead inventory, is because of the way they've got their warehouse organized. That's an insight that you have. If you can match your insights in with the customer's problems, you have really good topics to start to write about. And you're going to, if you start paying attention, the, the interesting thing about blogging is that if you make a commitment to write, you make a commitment to actually do this, what ends up happening is that your, your view on the world shifts and you stop seeing things through the lenses of, oh, that's annoying, or yeah, that was a dumb thing that somebody did, or you know, I can't believe that happened to, that would make a great blog post. And you start seeing things from a different angle. Um, I'll give you a quick story. You know, I was at Disneyland um, about a month and a half ago with my family. And so I've got a five-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 14-year-old. And I'd been to Disney World a number of times before, and I'd been to Disney World with my boys when they were younger, when they were like seven or eight. Now, I hadn't been to Disneyland, however. And so I, I had this point of comparison between Disneyland, which is the original, and Disney World in Orlando. And what came out of this ongoing attention I was paying to it in the back of my mind in terms of the comparison of one to the other was I have this whole blog post that I've almost got completely written at this point, not quite done, on how, uh, you know, one, one piece of your property can damage your overall brand. Because the experience I had in Disneyland was not anything that I would have expected compared to the experience I had in Disney, Disney World. And there's a message there for us as, as um, business owners and, and as business people to think about, you know, the, the, least, um, the least effective part of our organization tarnishes our entire brand. And so how do you pay attention to that? And because I write a blog and because I'm writing all the time, I notice things like that, and that starts to be something that you can bring together. So if you're paying attention to the sales calls that you're going on, you're paying attention to the questions that your customers are asking you, you start to get into some ideas of what you can write about. You know, so some other places to think about, you know, if you do a customer survey or you've got customer comment cards or feedback forms, um, if you've got an inbound help desk or an inbound call center, what are the questions you're getting there? Um, what are questions that come up from your sales meetings? I, I mentioned that. What are your vendors talking about? Are there governmental or rule changes that you can comment on? 
is there something one of your competitors wrote about that you want to comment on? Because you can tie one of your posts off of what somebody else said. So there's lots of different sources to get into how do I go and structure a really good post, something that is going to be informative, that's going to solve a problem for people. Right? And I want to make this relevant. I want to make it relevant to my audience. So I want to write so that I'm helpful. And if, if I say at the beginning, I'm not trying to sell myself, I'm not trying to sell my organization, I'm trying to be helpful, and in the process of being helpful, people will come to see us as an expert. That's kind of the attitude that you want to go at structuring a blog post with, right? And you need to remember that it's a blog post, it's not a dissertation. So you want to be brief. You don't need to put every single point in there. Um, when we say brief, you know, 500, 700 words is probably enough. By the way, 500 to 700 words translates into about a page to a page and a half in Microsoft Word if you're working in 12-point font. Um, I know this because I do this a lot. Um, you know, and you don't have to put everything in there because that gives you the opportunity to connect others in. So if you're referencing some expert that's out there or an article or a image that you saw, you can link that all into the post. That's the beautiful, beautiful thing about hyperlinks is that we can bring a lot of things together without having to put all the detail in on one page. You want to try and structure this as a story. Because if you make it, if you make it as a story, it's got a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you tie your points together, you make the whole story relevant to whatever it is that, that you're, you're focusing on. And then the, the last point on here, who are you writing for? Um, we talk to people all the time about the idea of, of having a persona, putting, a, putting the people together, you know, putting a, a composite image together of the person that you're writing for. And the easiest way for me to tell you why you should have a persona is to simply say to you, if you were going to write a love letter, you would not address it with to whom it may concern. Kind of would be a pointless love letter. So when we're writing a blog post, when we're trying to structure something, we want to keep that audience in mind. We want to keep in mind who is the person that we want to be reading this. And if we take the time to go and build a persona, which kind of lays out a composite of who this person is, what they care about, what are the problems they're trying to solve, we lay that all out, then we know who we're writing for. And you, now you're not staring at a white piece of white paper or a, a, a white word doc going, okay, what am I going to say? At least you've got a place to start where, you know, I'm writing this to Sally, and I know that Sally typically has these kind of problems. So what do I want, what do I want to say to Sally about how she solves one of those problems? Now that becomes a much more um, structured way to be able to go and write something. Now, just words get to be pretty boring, especially if you're doing it over and over again. So you want to think about how you make this entertaining. Now, you want to stay within your style. Again, you don't want every blog post to try and be a joke or to be funny, but you do want to mix it up a little bit. And so as you're writing a series of blog posts, you want to start to think about, am I serious or am I trying to take the light, lighter side in this particular post? Um, images help make your point, and they also tend to make it more entertaining. Um, you don't have to do every post as written words. Maybe you want to do a video post. And you know, set up the, the the camera in your in your computer and record a two minute post as opposed to actually typing it out. Um, I've worked with with one partner who did podcasts and their podcasts were their blog, so they post the podcast and then also post the transcript. So you can either listen or read. Your choice. Um, think about logical tangents. The uh, the one that I've got up here using Katz's analogy, what's the most realistic? That actually came off of a tax blog. Um, you know, he was he was he was getting to the to the lighter side and had a joke about cats and cats and accountants. So you know, it, it's a tangent. You know, taking advantage of some of the pop culture stuff with all the cats on the internet, um, but brought some humor into that. You know, I, um, I I wrote a blog post on Miley Cyrus and, and her performance at the video at the Video Music Awards. You know, it was it, pop culture references tend to get traffic and they give you something a fun way to talk about something. And then you also want to take a look at the trends that are out there. You know, what's going on in the background that, you know, that would support what you want to talk about? And so can, can you ride on a pop culture trend? Can you ride on a news trend? Is there something that you want to leverage off of 
and that makes it more relevant and more entertaining for people. All right. And as you're out there writing, you really want to establish your expertise. All right. So, you know, show your stuff, show your background. Um, Google has spent a lot of time and a lot of energy trying to establish authorship. They don't want people going in wholesale, ripping off one person's blog, putting it on their site and calling it their own. And so this is the one place, I, I question how relevant Google, uh, Google Plus is a lot, but this is the one place where it's very relevant. And having a full profile set up in Google Plus and telling it in your, telling Google Plus in your profile that you're a contributing author to a particular blog establishes your credibility in Google's eyes. So that when you write a post and you put it up, Google knows that it's related to you. And if somebody else grabs that content, then Google knows that in a search result, it's only going to show yours. So you want to go and build out your bio on LinkedIn because that's where a lot of people are going to learn details about you. You want to have a full bio and you want to have the, the authorship piece set up on Google Plus because that tells the search engine who actually created it. It, cre it establishes that authenticity of authorship. Within the post, wherever you can speak to your experience or bring an example into play, um, makes the post more credible. So you do want to reference your experience. And if you use an outside source, if you're bringing in a quote from somebody else or you read another article that triggered what you were talking about, um, cite your outside sources. Because we actually establish our own credibility better when we acknowledge that there's other people who've contributed to our success. You know, if you look at scholarly papers, if you look at um, um, doctoral theses, if you look at any of those, there's always lots and lots of references and footnotes. And it's people acknowledging that their thoughts or their approach is built on the work of others, and it establishes their credibility. We want to do the same thing inside of a blog. So if we, if we use an outside source, we want to reference them and bring it into play. All right. And we need to make it readable. So in terms of kind of a structure and an approach, um, the way that I go about this is that you know, first, I think about the topic that I want to talk about. Um, and I really try to translate that into a good title. Now, there's a couple of keys to a good title. One is that it, well, there's three, actually. One is that it's going to talk about what you're going to talk about. The second is that it's somewhat entertaining or it piques somebody's curiosity because, you know, a, a really boring title people tend to blow by. Um, and the third is that it has a keyword or two that is important to your website and to your overall SEO. So if you can get all three of those into a title, you're doing a really good job with a title. It's going to talk, talk about what's, what's in the article. Um, it's going to be somewhat either controversial or curiosity driving, and it's going to involve your keyword. And then I, want, then I go out in there and say, okay, so I'm going to write this post. What's the photograph I'm going to use to kind of represent it? Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's really hard. Um, Google Images is a great search engine to go and get ideas, um, but then at the same time you want to actually use licensed photography, either stock images or um, Getty Images just announced that you could use any of their images uh, as long as you use their, uh, their, their embedding engine to do it. So there's a lot of different images that you can have there. And then the, the last piece of it is, you know, don't overthink it. Back, back to what I was saying before, this is a blog post, not a dissertation. So don't, don't overthink it. When, when you start to write, you know, you want that lead paragraph um, to be conversational and you want, it, you want to make it clear that it's from your point of view. Um, and you want to put the best stuff up front. If you went to school in the U.S., or probably Canada actually as well, you were taught to write a certain way. You were taught that the way you structure a paper or a paragraph is that you have an introduction, and then you have built to some supporting points in the middle, and you end the paragraph with a conclusion, which is great for an English paper in high school. It doesn't work for a blog. For a blog, you actually have to turn that entire process on its head. You want to lead with your key points. What are you going to say? Get it, out, get it out in front. Get it in the first two sentences. And then go into how are you going to support it. And then lastly, 
tell the story around it that that you know it kind of would have been the introduction if you'd done it the other way around. So put the best stuff up front, right? Um, use use headlines, use bullets, make things strong and bold. Call out what's most important, but keep the paragraph length short, right? You want people to be able to read this stuff in a couple of minutes, and you want them to be able to not have to really focus. It's really hard to read on a screen, and a lot of stuff gets consumed on a mobile device. So short paragraphs where I don't have to scroll through a whole paragraph, I don't have to scroll through long sentences, makes your work a lot more readable. Right? And then, you know, it's, I, I think the phrase came out of an IBM sales training. I'm not sure exactly where it came from, but say what you're going to say, say it, tell them what you just said. And then end it with a call to action. End it with a question. You know, what do you think? Have you had this experience? Do you agree or disagree? Try to get people involved. If you look at the statistics on content contribution on the internet, um, about 1% of the people out there create content. Um, 9 to 10% will comment on content that other people have created. And about 90% of us do nothing. We'll read it, but that's it. So you want to try and engage that 10% that are willing to comment. Um, by asking a question or actually provoking them to, to give you an answer. All right, now, now doing this blog on a regular basis can get to be a real burden if you're trying to do all the writing yourself because you probably have a few other things to do in your day. So you know, one of the things that, that we encourage you to do is spread the burden around. You know, share the load. If you get a couple authors, it's only half the work. But let's say you've got eight people in your organization that have the potential to contribute. If you ask everybody to write just one post a month, set up a content calendar, ask everybody to write on one or two topics over the course of a month, probably 50% of them will actually do it. And so if you've asked eight people and half of them don't do it, you'll still end up with a post a week um, out of those eight. If you're going to take and spread this burden out across a bunch of different people and ask them all to write, make sure that you designate um, the blog executive editor. Who is going to be the person that's responsible for putting these posts up, who are going to edit them, who are going to make sure that the images are there, um, and that things flow in whatever your company style is. So, you know, designate a posting owner as well. And now that you've gone through all this work, you actually want to make sure you get some leverage out of it. Um, a lot of the stats that are running around out on the net today say you should be spending roughly about 10 times the amount of time promoting your content as you spend creating it. I think for professional authors, for professional bloggers, that's probably about right. For those of us who are trying to run companies and do other things in addition to blogging, that's a lot. Um, but it's still probably you know, a, a four or five to one ratio. So if it takes you an hour to write a blog post, you should be thinking about how do I spend five hours getting it promoted out there. All right. We want to make sure that we have a call to action once we put our post up on our site. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But once we put a post up, we want to make sure that it's up on our website, that we're putting it out on, on social via Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. If you can tie them all together, great. If you're using HubSpot, it'll tie it all together for you. Um, you want to go and maybe use that topic or that, that blog post as the core of maybe an article that you're going to do in a newsletter out to customers or to prospects. And you can, there's a number of different ways that you can do a monthly summary of blogs that go out by email. Uh, you can use Feedblitz to do that. If you're using HubSpot, it will allow you to do that as well. So you want to take that topic and that blog post and be able to get as much leverage and as much traffic out of it as possible. When I talk about a call to action, this is what I mean. This is actually one of our posts, and I'm going to reference this one a couple of times. Um, so this is a post we wrote on why your testimonial is so effective. And at the very end of the post is a call to action. Download our testimonial guide. So when somebody comes in and reads this post, they click on that button, they go to a landing page, and we have a, a two-page guide on how to write a great testimonial um, that they can download, providing that they're willing to register for it. And we capture their name and their email address and their company and their employee size. Um, you get results out of this, and I'll show you the numbers in a few minutes, but they get results. And if you don't have a call to action, what you're really doing is inviting people to come and do a window shop. You know, come, come window shop, come read all of our content, come learn from us but you never actually get the chance to interact with them. And so we're trying to drive conversion if we've gone through the effort to write a good blog post and to put it up there. So as you 
think about all this information that you want to put up, as you think about what you're going to share, think about what's that call to action that can help you convert somebody who's reading about this to somebody who can interact with you in some way, shape, or form. And at the end of the day, we need to create a routine because writing is a muscle. Blogging is a muscle that you need to learn to train. And if you create a routine and a content calendar around this, it makes it easier. So every day you're looking for you're looking for content that you might write about. You're paying attention to what's going on in the sales meetings that you're in, the calls that are coming into your health desk, et cetera. Um, I carry around a little um, two by three notebook, one of the one of the tiny little black and white covered notebooks. It's in my bag, it's in my my back pocket, it's in my jacket pocket all the time with me. And when I see something that might be worth writing about, I just make myself a note. Um, if you're more digital than you are analog, I'm very analog. Um, you know, you can use a, a recorder or the, the note on your smartphone, the reminder on your smartphone, whatever it is. But you want to keep track of the opportunities that, that you're seeing. Every week you're writing a blog post and you're putting it up. Every month you're sending out a summary. Every quarter you're sitting down, you're going back through that notebook and going, hey, here's all the great stuff that I saw over the last three months. Here's what I'm going to write about over the next three months. And just literally on each week say, here's the topic I'm going to write about. Because if you get to the beginning of a week or a Sunday night or whenever it is you decide that you're going to write your blog post and you don't know what to write about, you're probably not going to. So if you go and structure things out and build a calendar and say, hey, here's what I'm going to talk about when, it makes it much easier to actually get it done on a regular basis. All right, so we've talked through a lot of stuff. It's a lot of work. A whole bunch of things we've got to do. What comes out of this? So let me show you some results. I've got um, three different slides here, a couple of my one of Adrian's. All right. So that blog post I showed you on testimonial example. Right? We put that up originally June 7th last year. Since June 7th of last year, there have been almost 28,000 readers of that one particular blog post. I've had 700 people come in and register to download that testimonial worksheet. That's a lot of new names that we're now able to stay in touch with, people that we didn't know who existed. You can see my, my second most popular one in there is in terms of what should I ask about a testimonial or what question should I ask. That's gotten 16, almost 1,700. And then our third most popular is how can a small business marketing consultant help? And that's got 800. So you can see that you know there's there's a lot of different there's a big range there in terms of overall views. But if I just add up those top three, that's over 30,000 visits. If I was paying for that traffic, if I was doing pay-per-click ads to try and get that traffic, if I just take a really conservative number at 25 cents per click, I would have spent $7,500 with Google to get that, that amount of traffic. So, you know, is, is it financially worth it? Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, at, at 25 cents, I'm being incredibly conservative. So that's kind of the financial ROI around that. What does that also do for my website? Well, if I look at the page performance, all right, in the last year, and you can see the search dates up here. So from March 10th of 2013 to March 10th of 2014, we've had 42,648 views of blog posts that are out there. That's across all of them. Now about, you know, half, 55% are related to that one blog post, but the rest are spread across the other 200 posts on my site. So we have a lot of traffic and a lot of people that are coming in and understanding who we are. And what is our cost for writing a blog? Well, it's the cost of the time that it takes to write it and post it. So it's one of the most effective ways to drive traffic into your site and to get have your site be recognized as authoritative from the search engine. So, Adrian, the last slide here is I'm going to let you talk to it, but this is um, these are the, the the search results that ERP Bar has seen uh, after posting a blog post per day for one year. Adrian, you out there? I'm here. I hope you can hear me. I had a little uh, malfunction on my other computer, so I went to my backup. Um, am I sounding okay? Yep, we got you. Okay, good. You're sounding great. Perfect. Okay, so this is um, a graph of uh, Google, Bing, Yahoo, I'll Ask, uh, all the search engines, and the traffic that has resulted from our blogging efforts and our just our overall website in general. 
Um, as you can see, the uh, green bars have steadily gone up. We post a blog on average every day, and we send that blog through around 80 to 90 social media profiles um, of our participating value-added resellers. So what that does is send signals to the search engines that our site should have authority for keyword terms. So uh, most of the keywords are unknown keywords. So unknown keywords are uh, keywords that are long tail keywords, sentences that people might be sending into the search engines to find what they're looking for. Uh, so they're not disclosed here, but here are some of the, the, the keywords that people have indicated the exact match keywords to reach our site. So that happens uh, because of you know, all of the, the relationships we have with other websites out in the internet universe uh, and th those websites linking back into our websites. And a lot of those links are associated to social profiles when we publish a blog and send that blog through social profiles. So we have um, almost just as much traffic from social media as well. Uh, and so that everything kind of plays together and every all the relationships are interconnected on the on the web. So I look at a website as a as a salesperson and the more connected you are, the more traffic you'll get, the more content you publish, the more content you can syndicate through your connections and everything kind of works as an ecosystem. So that's kind of what I wanted to speak to on this slide. So, and, and yeah, it's a great point. You know, social doesn't work without content to, to to promote and talk about in social, and content doesn't work without some way to promote it. And so the two are symbiotic; they build off of each other. They have to. Great point. All right, so um, let's let's take a pause here. See if there are questions, things that people want to want to have us cover back off on and if there aren't that's okay if there are we'll answer them and then we've got we'll, we'll tie it up for you in terms of uh, a summary and we've got a couple offers for you as well so dan so. there's a question um on the blogging the guest blogging or the blogging in general uh you had indicated the help desk gets questions um, you know, when we're referring to ERP software, they might get questions on how to create a credit memo or um, how to create a repetitive invoice entry or something like that. Those are very easy topics, I would imagine, to blog about. Is that kind of what you're referring to? Because these consultants get these questions every day. So why not turn that question into a blog and then answer into a blog, right? Because if they're getting those questions, then chances are people on the in the search engines might be searching for an answer to that question, and then voila, your blog could come up. Yeah, and I think answering the common questions are a great way to do it. Um, I know I know some partners have done a great job of posting the error message numbers out of certain pieces of software as a blog title and then talking about what that error error message means or what that error that error number is and how you resolve it. So that's that's kind of the, the practical answer to those questions. The um the more th the more theoretical or the more insightful answer might be if you see a number of questions coming in over a period of time that are all related to the same type of topic. You know, it's related to inventory valuation for instance. You know, it's they tend to be how do I questions. But beyond, behind the how do I questions, there's a why do it this way type question that, that you can suss out from the, the bulk of questions that are coming in. Those can also be good, good topics for a blog post. But great question. So, I mean, it is imperative that the experts kind of get involved too to, to provide that expert content that the readers are looking for. And you know, not so much to directly rely on the marketing team, which also has knowledge, but not the knowledge of solving problems within you know the the software. Correct? Yeah, it, it, most 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 marketing people, um, unless they've come from the product background, can't write a good product blog post. But at the end of the day, you know, if you don't want all your content either to be product-based blog posts, you 
know, that's that's we're talking about the problems as opposed to the products themselves tends to drive traffic for you from people that are earlier in a purchase cycle. So that's from like a specific brand standpoint rather than a generic. Right. So I'm not seeing any other questions here. So we'll take a All right, minute. Well, it, just to remind the yeah, audience, yeah. just to remind the audience um, quickly, there is a question mark button and a raise your hand button next to your name on the webinar pane. If you do have a question, go ahead and indicate that by clicking on that question mark and a dialog box will come up and you will you can go ahead and indicate your question in the dialog box or go ahead and click on that raise your hand. If you're very brave, we'll unmute your line and we can speak lively live to you and have a live conversation. If not, we'll go ahead and proceed to uh, the contact slide. And I do have some polls to launch as well. Dan, do you think this is a good time to launch some polls? Sure. I, my, my, the next slide I've got is a summary. So if you want to throw a poll up there while we talk to the summary, that'd be great. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the first poll. Are you interested in learning more about guest blogging on ERP VAR? If I could get the attendees to answer that question, that would be wonderful. All right, and so while you're thinking about your answer, let's let's kind of wrap this up for you as, as a summary. Um, at, at the end of the day, you've got to remember that having a blog on your site, having a blog overall, it's not about getting followed, it's about getting found. And to get found, um, you need to be sharing some insights. You need to be adding something new to the conversation that's relevant to your customer, right? You want to you want to let the blog show your personality, show your company's personality. You want to be able to leverage the work that you're doing. Um, it's more effective if you figure out how to share the effort, so you don't have one person who's responsible for writing every single week, unless you have a dedicated writer on your staff, in which case they should be able to do it. Um, you know. Managing the whole process with a calendar, paying attention to what's going on around you so that you can go and sit down and say, hey, here's what I'm going to write about for the next 10 weeks is really helpful. And if you want your blog to be something other than just a traffic generator, you need to have a call to action. You need to have a way to get people to convert into someone that is going to interact with you, whether that's downloading a worksheet or registering for an ebook or whatever it might be. But give them some value-added reason to interact with you. All right. And, and, Adrian, you want to cut? and I do have a couple more comments here. Um, great job, folks. Thank you, Rick. We appreciate that. And is this a good time to tell us more about ERP VAR? Thank you, Char Charlie um, or Cheryl. <laughs> I really appreciate that plug. What do you think? Dan? I, I think it is, and I think there's a slide up for you on that. <laughs> Perfect. So here's the standard services that we offer uh, VARs for one-year participation. Uh, you get a directory listing, which is search engine optimized for your location. So let's say you had a Sage 100 ERP practice in New York. We create a page that's optimized for Sage 100 ERP New York. Uh, and then you get a a, a point listing on our map. So um, there's a little icon on the map in New York um, that's also optimized for Sage 100 ERP on a good day. Um, those rankings fluctuate, but you did see some search coming in for Sage 100 ERP. I think that the highest we've ranked for Sage 100 ERP is uh, number eight uh, in Google. So um, somebody would, would type in Sage 100 ERP and then just land on that map um, if they clicked on our uh, title and our meta description in Google and the Google search return. They would land on that map, and then if they were in your area, hopefully they'd click on your pin on the map, and then they'd come to a page with your directory listing that talked all about you. It might have some call to actions like a white paper from Dan. Dan also helps us create those location pages for his clients. So he can also optimize your pages to get the CTA conversion, which is a, a call to action. He'd work with you to create that call to action and possibly place a white paper behind that call to action. But Dan's very strategic 
So it makes sense to work with Dan on creating your location page, but you get that location page and your phone number and a conversion form to convert the uh, visitor into a, a lead for you. Uh, we can include success stories, videos, white papers, all the things I just mentioned. Um, so as a result, the goal is to receive inbound leads from all of the search engine optimization efforts that we go through to bring leads into ERP VAR. We work with one channel partner per product per city. So if there were a lead that came in, we would only align that lead to one of our subscribers in that location because we really feel that customers are best served by an expert that is as close to them as possible so that they don't have to pay for travel time and they can get that attention that is required when you're doing an ERP implementation because they're all painful until you get uh, a, a solution fully Im Im implemented. It's nice to be able to, to talk um, on a one-on-one -on -one, face to face basis with your ERP implementation consultant. Um, and then all, you get also the, the uh, collective social media efforts of the ERP bar participants that are guest blogging. Those blogs are sent through um, 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 many, many different social media profiles of our ERP VAR participants. So our ERP VAR participants have given us their username and login so that for their social profiles so that we can send those blogs through their profiles. They enjoy the updates that they are able to share via social media because it's relevant to them. Even though, you know, some people can think, well, that's a competitor to me. Well, you know what? Your picture is showing up and you're, if, you're, if you're seen, it's better than not being seen. And you're talking about relevant information to the products that you sell. So you're sharing someone else's expert blog that shows that you're also the expert. So you're helping one another. And at the same time, we're bringing that inbound traffic back into ERP VAR so the whole community can benefit. So working together to, to get more. Um, we increase the SEO from the collective, from everybody's collective efforts. And those inbound links that are very important, we're passing off to you so that we can pass that traffic off to your website when you're guest blogging, you have a link in, in the guest blog as well. So that passes traffic over to your site. Now, there's some new rules with the Google algorithm. So you don't want to have too many page rank passing links in a blog. So we limit to one, one page rank passing link per blog. But if you guest blog with us, we can you have as many no follow uh, links in that blog. Um, as you want, we just won't we won't pass page rank with, for those links because those are a flag to Google now, and you will you could potentially get penalized. So we're we're adhering to all the new guidelines, but Google does like guest blogging sites like ours that are definitely expert guest blogging sites. So um, we are you know working working toward building up that traffic so that the whole community can benefit and the end users because they're looking at that expert information that's so important that they want to review and they want that they want to have that collective information from the experts because they're they're going to be spending a lot of money on their new ERP system. So um, and then also with help with Dan Kraus and the leading results team, they can build uh, your guest blogs for you and they can post them directly on our site for you so that, you know, you, you know, I know you're busy consulting. So uh, with the direction of Dan's team, you could have this uh, process fully automated. And Dan can also help you with your, your website. So Dan, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, only to say that, you know, we've got a bunch of things that we've written on, on our site. And actually one of the offers that, uh, that we'll give to you is uh, we've got an ebook on 12 things to do to improve your overall website performance. Um, but what we've seen time and time again is a lot of partners will say, yeah, we're going to improve our marketing efforts and we're going to start by redoing our website. And the, the one thing I'd encourage you to do is figure out your marketing strategy and everything you're going to do and then do your website because 90% of the time we'll start to work with somebody and the first thing they'll say is, well, we just redid our website three months ago and we're going to end up redoing their site for them again at the end of the day because while they did it and made it look pretty, 
it did act, they didn't do it in a way that actually made it functional to generate leads for them, which is ultimately what we're trying to get to. So, you know, so something to keep in mind as you're thinking about your website. Um, the spe speaking of offers, um, Adrian's going to send you out a link, um, hopefully shortly, um, to, to just do an evaluation on um, the presentation today. If you'd like a copy of the slides, we are happy to give you a copy of the slides. Um, we just ask you to complete the evaluation, and in that evaluation will be uh, the link to the, uh, the the link to the ebook or the request for the ebook on 12 ways to improve your website as well. So you can take that and, and go through it, and we'd appreciate the feedback because we make these better by getting your feedback and hearing what we did well and what we could have done better. All right. Um, so Adrian, I'm going to give it back to you to close off. I, I really appreciate you having me and giving me the chance to talk to everybody. Uh, thank you so much. You did a great job, Dan. We really appreciate your time. And we do have another question from Cheryl. Cheryl, thank you so much. Uh, she just wants clarification on one partner per product per city. Yes, you are correct. We can only optimize uh, per city, a page in, in the Google index per city. So that city would belong to you. So let's just say Microsoft Dynamics GP New York. Um, if that was your city and it was not already taken on ERP VAR, then if you wanted to purchase that for $1,000 for an annual subscription, that would be your city, and that would offer you unlimited guest blogs on ERP VAR. So you could publish a guest blog every day if you wanted to on ERP VAR. You could publish a guest blog once a month or even once a year. But the more guest blogs you publish, the more optimization that's, that page will get because you can tie it back into that city page, the more optimization you'll get for your website because you're pointing your, a link back to your website. So everything on the internet is a connection and the more connections you have and the more content you push out there and push your links out there, the more authority your website is going to get. So hopefully that answers that question. And uh, here's our contact information. I'm gonna go ahead and include this in the recording. So anybody that would like the recording and the slides, I'm gonna send out a little survey afterwards to just complete that survey as Dan had suggested, and we will get you the recording and the slides. And we really appreciate you spending time with us today. Thank you so much. And uh, Dan, thank you for uh, talking with us today. My pleasure, glad to be here. Thanks much. All right, everybody. Hey, have a fantastic day. We really appreciate it.